Ah, oh, wedding vows. We all know the words. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. Most of us say them with the best intentions. But for some people, the only way to keep those vows is to hurry along the last one. Till death do us part. Something stinks about this, Gary. Sometimes the fairer sex, the one you'd least expect, is the one capable of unspeakable acts. This wasn't a bar fight. This wasn't road rage. We have a subject that has a gunshot wound. This was a cold and calculated murder. From former beauty queens to all-American cheerleaders. I've never shot a gun in my life. Deadly wives come in all shapes, sizes, and endless varieties of crazy. They're leaving. They're leaving. In the 30 years I've been a DA, I've prosecuted a lot of really nasty people. I've never dealt with a woman as evil and selfish as this particular woman is. This is Deadly Wives. Something ain't right here, man. I'm telling you. Welcome to West Goshen, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia that's made the list of top 10 best towns in America. It's the kind of place where kids grow up and stay to raise their own families. So June 20th, 2010 was a big day. It was Father's Day. Kevin Mengel Sr. and his son Kevin Jr. had recently healed their rocky relationship and the whole family was gathering for a special celebration. Kevin and I had not spent a Father's Day together in seven years. And uh, we were very, very excited and uh, looking very much forward to it. By three o'clock, everyone was at Kevin Sr.'s house, except Kevin. That's when they got a surprising text message from his wife, Morgan. It said, uh, sorry, due to unforeseen circumstances, we will not be able to make it today. Love you, happy Father's Day. That was it. The Father's Day party was spoiled, and Kevin's family knew it had something to do with Morgan. It always did. Their relationship was a roller coaster. It was them fighting, her saying that she hates him, I can't stand him, I'm leaving him, and then the next day, come over to the house and say, Kevin and I are going to the jewelry store, we're getting a new engagement ring. That's how up and down Kevin and Morgan's relationship was. <laughs> ah, love. Such a fickle little beast. When Kevin and Morgan first met 13 years earlier, they were great together. Morgan was a very loving, caring, pretty girl. And she bent over backwards for Kevin. She seemed like the ideal girlfriend to have. She seemed like a catch. But their relationship began to change when Kevin realized Morgan and the truth were not exactly best friends. Morgan! Morgan would lie about things that didn't need to be lied about. She would tell Kevin, yes, I paid the cable bill. And he would say, okay, great, the cable bill's paid. And then two weeks later, the cable gets shut off. And the lies just kept on coming. Morgan was arrested for shoplifting, writing her bad checks to the supermarket. It was just always something with Morgan that she did, a lie, a steal, a cheat. And it almost became regular for us friends to hear that Morgan had done something again. And the biggest doozy came after they'd been dating about a year. Morgan showed up for a family dinner looking suspiciously, well, not to be judgy, but a little chubby. We all kind of looked at Morgan and thought, wow, looking pregnant there to us. Finally, somebody said something to her about, geez, you look, you know, are you okay? Are you pregnant? No, no, I'm not pregnant, I'm pregnant. I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, bloated, I guess. She was bloated, all right. Bloated with eight pounds of healthy baby girl. In fact, Morgan gave birth the very next day. Even when we went in to see her after she had the baby, she sat very nonchalant. And I, yeah, well, I had a baby. And don't know what happened. That doctor told me I wasn't pregnant. I don't understand it at all. I don't understand how that happened. But it didn't matter to Kevin. He loved Morgan, and he loved being a father. Kevin was very happy to have a, a little baby girl. 
he held her with joy and loved her from day one. Kevin and Morgan got married. Then Kevin started a landscaping company. Morgan helped out with the business, and they had two more children. Where Kevin took a children first, Morgan took a Morgan first, children second. Morgan was into Morgan. <laughs> Morgan was a very self-centered person, so whatever pleased Morgan or made Morgan happy is what she did. And one of the things that made Morgan happy was having affairs with Kevin's friends. Kevin knew and he was crushed, he was hurt. They just destroyed him. But no matter what Morgan did, Kevin defended her and always forgave her. You know, she would go off with a guy and when she wanted to show back up, she would show up and knock on the door and he would open up the door and let her in. Kevin came from a divorce household and it took a toll on him growing up. And I think Kevin was not going to allow that to happen with his family. He was going to keep his family intact at all costs. So when Kevin didn't show up at his dad's Father's Day party, and Morgan was the one sending the text, Kevin's family reached out to Kevin. They tried texting and calling, but Kevin didn't answer. That's when Kevin's family compared notes and realized no one had seen or talked to Kevin in days. That's not like him at all. Not his brother and sister, not his mother, no one. And his mother, he essentially talked to her every day, every day, called her. So it was reason for us to be concerned. In fact, they were so nervous they called police and filed a missing persons report. What everybody thought was, Maybe something terrible had happened in the relationship, and Kevin went off the deep end. The next day, police checked in with Morgan. She told them she wasn't the least bit concerned. She says, look, I have text messages from my husband. I have phone calls from my husband. He just took off. According to Morgan, their landscape business was in trouble, and poor Kevin just couldn't take the stress. Then she showed police a text she'd received four days earlier. I hate to do this to the kids, but I'm not happy. I don't want this life anymore. You can deal with the business however you want. It looked like nothing more than an unhappy man wanting a time out from his stressful life. So police didn't pursue an investigation. Kevin's family didn't believe he would walk away from his children. Something was definitely wrong. Hey, Kev, it's me. And so then we all began to call and text Kevin and say, Kevin, come on, let's talk. What's going on here? And we would get text messages back saying, I'm OK. I just want to be left alone. I told Morgan, take care of the business. I need to get away. Don't bother me. That was the answer we were getting. When Kevin's family tried to reach him by phone, calls went unreturned. But the texts kept coming in. Not hearing his voice made us nervous. And we thought, why can't he call us if he's OK? And there was something else. Kevin didn't sound like himself. Kevin's messages would be very short and brief. He would use uh, the letter U instead of Y-O-U. And he wouldn't use punctuation and proper grammar. And all of a sudden, it was always proper spelling, proper punctuation. And Kevin doesn't text like that. And Kevin wasn't the only one acting strangely. Just one week after Kevin disappeared, his wife, 34-year-old mother of three, Morgan, had a new live-in boyfriend, Steve Chappelle, a 21-year-old who worked for Kevin's landscaping business. The pretense was that Kevin wanted Uncle Steve, according to Morgan, to be there to watch over the kids while he was away. And it looked like Uncle Steve was really taking his new role seriously. He was seen holding Morgan's hand at her apartment complex pool and riding around in Morgan's truck, taking the kids out for ice cream. They acted as if they had been a couple forever. It was very bizarre. And the entire family just kept asking us, are, are you kidding me? I, I just can't believe this. So police brought Morgan's new boy toy in to have a friendly chat about why he was holding hands with the boss's wife. I said, it's not a crime to have an affair with a married woman, but it is a crime to lie to the police. And that's when he stopped and he paused for a moment. He says, OK, well, 
yeah, we are having an intimate affair. According to Steve, Morgan the Cougar came on to him. She would tell him how uh, handsome he was, and, and he fell for it. And they first had intercourse in a pickup truck at a job site, and then they had intercourse a couple times at the shop. And I asked him, I said, well, did Kevin find out about this? And no, 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 Kevin didn't find out. But now Kevin was missing, and detectives had an idea Steve might be leaving out a few details. I said, well, is it possible that Morgan did something to Kevin? And Morgan is going to set you up? She's going to say that you're having an affair with her. You fell in love with her, and something happened to Kevin. And she's going to blame this entire thing on you. And he starts to cry and tells me that he doesn't want to answer any more questions. Suddenly, Kevin's absence was looking a lot more suspicious. He had disappeared into thin air, and police would soon learn that's exactly where they had to look to find him again. Kevin Mangle of West Goshen, Pennsylvania, had vanished. But when police talked to Morgan, his wife of 13 years, she said Kevin couldn't take the stress of his life anymore and simply up and left. She had moved on, too. Morgan was now living with her new 21-year-old boyfriend. But police believed there was more to the story, and so did Kevin's family. And when his mother got a text message from Morgan asking to take care of the children for a couple of days, Chris, come here a minute. Kevin's family was instantly suspicious. And my son Chris was there, and he said that she's getting ready to bolt. They knew Morgan better than we did, so they decided to sit on the apartment all night long. Early the next morning, Kevin's brother, Chris, spotted Steve leaving Morgan's apartment. That's him. He's walking out. He's got a bag. Morgan came out with more bags and carried them to her truck. They're getting yeah, in the truck now. Chris called the police. Can I get hold of Detective Maurer real quick? His wife and the new boyfriend are making a move right now to leave. They're leaving. They're leaving. Chris followed behind. But Morgan and Steve didn't go very far, only down the road to Kevin's landscaping business. As it happened, Detective Maurer was already there working a hunch. I was hoping maybe Kevin was sleeping in a shop at night and hiding from Morgan. And I look up and in comes Morgan's pickup truck. Steve's staring straight ahead, and Morgan gets out of the pickup truck and walks right by and brushes by my shoulder. And I said, wow, that's, you know, that's, that's odd. As Detective Maurer turned to talk to Morgan, Steve took off. So I turned to Morgan, I said, what's going on? She has this dumbfounded look on her face. Things aren't looking too good with Steve, are they? Says, Oh my God, maybe he did do something to Kevin. Detective Maurer immediately put out an alert for Steve and took Morgan to the police station to figure out what was going on. Steve has been staying at your place, but Kevin's your husband. Correct. Did you ever think that maybe Kevin would come home and Steve would be there and there would be an issue? No, I hadn't thought about that. Are you looking for trouble? No, I'm not. This poor judgment. Poor judgment, but it also makes me think that somebody knew that Kevin wasn't going to come home. And Morgan wanted to make sure that police understood the somebody who knew Kevin wasn't going to come home was Steve Chappelle. Steve had said to me that he loved me and would do whatever it took to have me. Do you think maybe Steve hurt Kevin? Steve hit Kevin in the back of the head with a shovel. Did you catch that? Let's listen again. Steve hit Kevin in the back of the head with a shovel. Whoa, you know, uh, I said, OK, why, why didn't you tell me this earlier? Are you trying to protect Steve? Not at this point. Were you? No. Then why wouldn't you tell me that stuff? I don't know. We knew something was seriously wrong. But we didn't know if Kevin was alive, if they had done something to Kevin. We, we didn't know what the story was. And Morgan wasn't very forthcoming. 
So police held her in an interview room while they contacted cell phone companies, hoping to track Steve by the GPS in his phone. They didn't find Steve, but they did discover an enormous amount of text messages between Steve and Morgan. These people text like they breathe, and there's thousands and thousands of text messages. Somewhere in that mass of data could be vital information about Kevin's disappearance, but getting at it seemed almost impossible. It was very confusing because text messages are not in chronological order with conversation. They're in chronological order by time. Police put together a team of officers. They spent hours sifting through the mountains of text messages. We began reading the conversations, and we were yelling them over the cubicles back and forth so that we could make sense of what it was that they were talking about. At first, they saw hints, glimpses of something dark and chilling. Then suddenly, it was uh, mid-afternoon when we had gotten to the point we were learning exactly what had gone on. And it wasn't good. Kevin Mengel had been a victim of foul play. And Steve Chappelle and Morgan Mengel's text messages were a literal play-by-play -play of the deadly plan. As a widow, Morgan would get everything, the kids, the company, and her freedom. And with Steve's help, she could make that happen. Morgan Mengel repeatedly told Stephen Chappelle that if Kevin would go away, that he could have the business and the two of them would be happy ever after. Using the text messages as a narrative, police could finally lay out the Lovebirds' toxic plot. It started with research on the internet. That's where Morgan and Steve found the recipe for liquid nicotine. A few concentrated drops can be lethal. At 7.57 p.m. on June 19, 2010, Steve was at his mom's house cooking up the nicotine. His sous chef, Morgan, checked in. Once Steve cooked the nicotine down, he put it into a bottle of Kevin's favorite iced tea. Then he gave it to Morgan. And then in the morning, puts it on Kevin's truck for Kevin to drink. Just as they'd hoped, Kevin drank the iced tea. Then he drank some more. Everything was moving along according to plan. Well, almost. After two hours, Kevin was still going strong. It wasn't fatal, but it was enough that it may have started to make him nauseous or feel lightheaded or something like that. They were still optimistic that their special recipe would do the job. But just in case, they had a backup plan. Unhappy with her marriage, Morgan Mangle recruited 21-year-old Steve Chappelle to help kill her husband, Kevin. They tried poisoning him by spiking his iced tea with liquid nicotine. It didn't work. That's when they switched to their backup plan. As Kevin is working on the hedge trimmer, Steve comes from behind and hits him over the head. Hits him hard enough, the shovel actually breaks in half. Kevin is still alive. He grabs his second shovel, hits him a second time, and a third time. That shovel also breaks in half. But at this time, he thinks Kevin is deceased. He, he stops breathing. steps right over her dead husband's body and gives him a kiss. 
and starts giving orders. We gotta clean this up, get a tarp, I'll turn the water on, this is what we're gonna do. She then takes over. They wrapped the body in a tarp, tied it up with twine, and left it in the shop. Four days later, Steve drove the body to a wooded area and buried it. People sometimes miss understand who commits a murder. It's not always a cold-blooded TV type murder. Sometimes a murderer is, is, is a weak person. And Stephen Chappelle is a weak person that Morgan Mangle knew that, pushed his buttons, got him to do this crime. So while her young boyfriend was off burying her husband's body, Morgan was using Kevin's phone to text herself and Kevin's family and friends, trying to convince everyone that her husband had left her and her children to start a new life. She had her telephone and his telephone in the same vehicle, sending text messages back and forth to herself. She would use his telephone to text, then she would respond with her telephone. Morgan's cleverness didn't stop there. She thought that when she planned this crime out with her lover, that when she texted to him back and forth, that she could delete these texts. If only she'd been a bit more tech savvy, she would have known that the phone company had a record of every single text she'd sent and received. If she had been able to cover her tracks like that, who knows? And that brings us back to little liar Morgan at the police station, caught red-handed with her pile of very revealing texts. I told her that the game was over. I told her that we knew what had gone on. You have one last chance to tell us exactly what happened and what's going on. You know that we know. Somebody was killed. You understand that? Who is that person? Kevin. And Kevin who? Michael. And who is that person to you? My husband. Morgan was arrested on the spot. Her boy toy was caught only a few days later. He confessed everything. He was scared to death. He was super remorseful and cried the entire time, and you could barely, you could barely hear his voice. I snapped, and the next thing I knew, I had a shovel in my hand, and I was falling. But as soon as I realized what I did, I panicked. Steve Chappelle pled guilty to murder. He was sentenced to a minimum of 40 years. While in prison, he agreed to testify against the conniving cougar, Morgan Mengel. And given his damning account of what happened, Morgan took the prudent approach and pled guilty. I think she had a goal in mind, and she wasn't going to stop. I just am amazed. I am amazed. There, there, I've never, ever in my life thought that there was, could be a person as, as ugly as, as this person. There is no one colder in this world in my mind than that woman. There is no one. Pretty young deadly things grow just about anywhere. And that brings us to our next story. This is Robinson, Texas the kind of place where nothing much ever happens. But on November 9th, 2005, the small town outside Waco was shaken to its core. 911, what's your emergency? Hello? The young woman calling 911 was 31-year-old Darlene Gentry. This morning, I was in my country, and I didn't sleep. My door was open. There's blood on the bed, and she is struggling. The he she was referring to was her husband, Keith Gentry, and it appeared Keith had been shot. Officers raced to the Gentry home. We have a subject that has a gunshot wound. Time out, 612. When they arrived, they spotted guns lying on the front lawn. It appeared that there could have been a burglary gone wrong. Go check the inside. Go check the guy. Watch yourself going in. Robinson Police. I'm sorry, what? Right. Stand right here and just keep scanning. Don't let anybody near them guns. Darlene met police at the front door and led them to her husband. 
31-year-old Keith Gentry was unconscious, bleeding from a wound in the back of his head. Sir, can you hear me? He was alive, but didn't know how long Keith would survive the uh, wound that he received. Paramedics stabilized Keith and rushed him to the hospital. Police turned to Darlene, hoping to get to the bottom of what happened. Do you have any idea who this could have been? I have no idea. Okay, do you know which way they went? No, I saw nothing. Do you, you hear a car drive off real quick or anything? I heard nothing. Poor Darlene Gentry. Her husband, Keith, was on his way to the hospital, and she might soon be a tragic young widow. This was not the way their love story was supposed to go. Darlene and Keith met when they were both in college. Darlene was a classic Texas beauty, a former high school cheerleader and homecoming queen. She was just very outgoing, just very friendly and talkative and nice. Keith was darkly handsome with an easy grin and a reputation as a ladies' man. Good girl, bad boy. Well, that's a story we all could tell. But back to Darlene and Keith. For them, it was love at first sight. My daughters and I thought that Darlene was the one for Keith. We tell everybody we had picked <laughs> for him. We loved Darlene, all of us did. But after dating Darlene steadily for months, Keith suddenly dumped her. I think it's a guy thing. <laughs> he wanted to date other people, maybe. Brokenhearted, Darlene moved to Dallas, leaving her dream man 100 miles away. But like any good love story, this one looked like it was going to have a happy ending. A year after their breakup, Keith drove to Dallas, flashed that grin, and persuaded Darlene to come back to him. In 1999, they married. Keith was working as an architectural draftsman, and Darlene was a registered nurse. They seemed to have it all. It was just the two of them. They both had good jobs, and I think they were real happy because they were able to do whatever they wanted to do. Soon their happiness multiplied. Within four years, Keith and Darlene had three healthy sons, an idyllic life now shattered by a gunshot in the night. At the local hospital, Keith was barely hanging on. While doctors worked to save his life, police were at his home trying to make sense of the crime scene, and it wasn't easy. There was no sign of forced entry and no explanation for the guns left on the front lawn. This didn't look like a routine burglary. And so we had a lot of unanswered questions. How did someone get in the house? to steal weapons, and if they stole weapons, why shoot the, the man who was asleep? Something stinks about this, Gary. Something ain't right here, man, I'm telling you. And it appeared that the stink might be coming from Keith's loving wife, Darlene. Her attitude wasn't making any more sense than the crime scene. So police invited her down to the station. Just tell me in your own words, y'all activity from last night to this morning. According to Darlene, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. She went to bed at 11.30 and two hours later awoke to one of her sons crying. He woke me up at 1.30. He had pooped in his diaper and wanted to be changed. And I know I did go out the side door to throw the poopy diaper in the black barrel out there like we always do. Then she came in and went back to bed. Honestly and truly, I don't remember if I physically locked the door back. So I'm not going to say one word or the other because I don't know. She fell asleep in the kids' room, and she finally got up at 6 a.m. I got to the little foyer by our bedroom, and I realized the gun cabinet was open, and there were no guns inside of it. And so then I screamed at Keith, telling him those guns were not in the gun cabinet, that he needed to get up. But Keith didn't respond, so Darlene went into the bedroom. That's when she found him bleeding. Sleeper or Normally, I'm fairly, I'd say light, just because of kids. But once they wake me up, I'm very light. But that first, when I go out, I'm out until I get woke up. So a two-year-old whimpering down the hall in a dirty diaper is enough to rouse Darlene. 
but a firearm blast just feet away, and she sleeps like a baby. Police weren't buying it. There had to have been a gunshot that went off inside that house, and gunshots are loud. I, and that's what I keep trying to physically wrap my brain about. But the interview was cut short. Darlene needed to go to the hospital. Her husband was dying. And that meant police were no longer looking for a burglar. They were looking for a killer. And they suspected they already had her in their sights. A mysterious pre-dawn attack had left Keith Gentry with a bullet wound in the back of his head. Six hours after arriving at the hospital, Keith was pronounced dead. At his home, police were working what was now a murder scene, trying to piece together what happened. They focused on the guns inexplicably left in front of the Gentry house. Usually, if there's a burglary, the people take what they came there to take. Immediately, they're thinking, there's something really strange. Keith's father was on the scene. He confirmed for police that those guns were, in fact, his sons. But there was a problem. And I said, well, I see all of his guns, but I don't see the 22 pistol. He had a 22 pistol that I'd given him. And they said, well, it's not there. We looked in the vents. We looked under beds, under cushions, everywhere that we could think that somebody could place a weapon. They found no sign of the missing 22. But they did find a 22 caliber casing in the kitchen trash, wrapped up in a bloody surgical glove. And there was one person who was very familiar with using surgical gloves, who happened to live there. We all knew that Darlene Gentry was a registered nurse. It was time to bring Darlene back in to get some clarity. Do you keep a surgical gloves? Yeah, I do, just because half time they're in my pocket when I come home from work. Did you have any reason to throw any in the kitchen trash? I mean, not recently, I don't believe. And police were curious. Just how familiar was she with firearms? Have you shot a gun lately, or? I've never shot a gun in my life. I've picked his guns up and things like that, but I've never physically shot it. And Darlene was hanging on to, I had nothing to do with my husband's murder, until the police asked her to sign a statement saying exactly that. Let's you look over that and read it before you sign it. I don't think I'm going to sign until I get an attorney so that way they can. I'm just not doing this alone because. It was finally dawning on Darlene that maybe police weren't totally buying the innocent act. Now, can I leave? Yeah. But once she requested a lawyer, the police had to let her go. Thank you for being so cooperative. <sighs> Five days later was Keith's funeral. For most, it was a sad affair. For Darlene, it was the perfect opportunity to break out that little black dress she'd been saving for a special occasion. And to the surprise of her in-laws, she rented a pina colada machine for the after-service gathering. The homecoming queen was back in town. Meanwhile, the mood was less festive down at the police station. Detectives were looking over the crime lab results, and Darlene was in trouble. Remember when Darlene said, I've never shot a gun in my life. Not true, according to the gunshot residue found on her hands. And the bloody surgical glove from the trash can? There was DNA from Keith Gentry, his blood on the outside of the glove, and on the inside of the glove was DNA from Darlene Gentry. Well, at this point, we became very focused on the possibility that Darlene Gentry had murdered her husband and had staged a, a burglary to try to cover up that murder. What we didn't know is we didn't know a motive. We didn't understand why. Police continued digging into Keith and Darlene's life. It soon became clear that what looked like the perfect couple was anything but. I mean, Keith and Darlene got along really good. 
after a while, things kept falling further and further apart. According to family and friends, Darlene began to change when she became a mother. The more children she got, she seemed to get more irritable. She didn't have the patience as the third one come along as she did with the first one. I do think that Darlene struggled with not being everyone's focus anymore. Once she had those three little boys, they were the focus. They were the focus of her in-laws and her friends and everyone. Didn't diminish anything about who she was, but maybe in her mind it did. So what did the homecoming queen turned average mother do? She started spending money like a movie star, hoping to buy that I'm someone special feeling. And it didn't come cheap. She drained the nest egg. Then she maxed out the credit cards. Police learned that Keith found out about Darlene's wild shopping sprees the day before he died. And when he came home, he said he had received two phone calls from different creditors. And he was not a happy camper. Police suspected her husband confronted her. Darlene! Furious, and it led to a terrible fight. And she devised this plan in her mind to murder him. And then she would be the beneficiary of any type of life insurance that, that he had. And even though she hadn't collected the money yet, somehow it was burning a hole in Darlene's pocket. So just 14 days after burying her husband, Darlene was out shopping for a new home. Immediately, she found a prime piece of real estate on the outskirts of town. That's when she made a phone call back to ask if the uh, stock pond came with it. And uh, that's when I assured her it did. She said, this is great because Keith always wanted a place for his kids to go fishing. A tranquil pond, rolling hills, and lots of beautiful old oak trees. The ideal spot to build a new home and start a new life. But a few days after insisting the property was perfect, she called the land broker to say that tranquil fishing pond was an issue. She wouldn't buy the property unless the pond was filled in. The first thing that flashed in my head was, uh, you know, that's why she wanted it for her kids to be able to go fishing, and now she wants me to cover it up. But Darlene had no idea that her simple request had set in motion a high-stakes game of hide-and-seek that she wouldn't win. Less than two weeks after Keith Gentry was shot while he was sleeping at home in his bed, his wife Darlene was out shopping for a new piece of property. She found something she liked, but later raised suspicions when she told the land broker she'd only buy the property if he filled in the pond. The land broker called the Texas Rangers. Anyone who is raised in rural America would realize that a pond on a piece of land is an asset. They want ponds dug. They want ponds for the recreation use of it all. But nobody usually wants a pond filled in. A red flag went up. I knew that there had to be something in that pond that she didn't want somebody to find. And the first thing I thought of was that she's thrown that pistol in the pond. Police sent in a dive team to literally try and dredge up the truth. The divers did a walk through with their metal detectors. And that's when they heard that high-pitched buzz that told them they had a bite. They reeled in a 22 caliber pistol. Ballistic tests confirmed it was the gun that killed Keith Gentry. Now it was time to prove who put it there. Police asked the land broker to call Darlene and to tell her he was happy to accommodate her request. But first, he'd have to drain the water. She immediately began to get nervous. I mean, I could tell by her voice that uh, something was not right. Police moved into position. They placed a hidden camera in the woods focused on the exact spot where they recovered the gun. Then they waited. Ranger Cawthon stayed with the camera. I went out onto the highway and set up, waiting for her to show up. And 
sure enough, a Suburban showed up, which was the vehicle that Darlene normally drove. I contacted Matt by cell phone and said, she's at the scene, start the camera and leave, which is what he did. And in the video, you can see Ranger Cawthon running off into the woods. A few moments later, there she was. Darlene Gentry, cheerleader, homecoming queen, wife, mother, and murderer. Why else would she be there unless she was the one responsible for disposing of the gun? Darlene came wearing rubber boots. Now watch. She walks around surveying. Then she wades into the pond, making her way to the exact spot where the Texas Rangers recovered the gun the day before. She appears to have some type of a long stick and begins probing around on the bottom of the pond in an attempt to, to find something. But what the little fisher girl didn't know was more seasoned fishermen had already reeled in the prize catch. Don't you just love a good sting? That afternoon, Darlene was arrested. The sum total of evidence was overwhelming. Police believe the couple fought about money, then went to bed in separate rooms. Boy! But Darlene didn't sleep. In the middle of the night, she got out of bed, put on a pair of surgical gloves, opened the gun cabinet, and took out Keith's 22. Then she shot her husband point blank as he slept. She opened the revolver, pulled the spent shell out, and peeled off the gloves, keeping the casing inside. She then staged the crime scene to make it look like a burglar was responsible. At some point, she removed the gun from the house and dumped it into the pond. Police had Keith Gentry's killer. In February 2007, Darlene was put on trial for first-degree murder. I think that she thought when she got in front of the jury that she could just sit there and bat her eyes, and they would think never, never would this sweet little thing commit a crime like this. But they did. 